Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I am pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts discussion titled Choosing the Best Summer Camps for Your ADHD Child, a Guide for Parents. Leading today's presentation is Ryan Wexelblatt. Ryan is the founder and director of ADHD Dude and Trip Camp, a licensed clinical social worker, camp owner and director, father to a son with ADHD and lifelong camper. Ryan creates content for parents and kids at the ADHD Dude YouTube channel. ADHD Dude provides virtual parent training as well as in-person social learning programs for boys with ADHD. Ryan and his son live in Tucson, Arizona. Trip Camp is located in both Margate, New Jersey and in Tucson. In today's webinar, we are not going to recommend specific summer camps or programs. Instead, Ryan is gonna teach us how to make an informed decision about camp so that everyone is prepared, including our kids and the camp staff. You'll learn about the key questions to ask, the important considerations to make, and the best options available for addressing problems that might arise along the way. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking a poll question to our live audience. When you think about your child's summer plans, what are your top three priorities? Please select your answers and you can comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. You'll see the poll results when you submit your response. So while you do that, I will just note that you can download today's slides by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in an email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast and a transcript of today's events will be made available in the coming week. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 442 to access the slides, replay, certificate of attendance, info, and transcript. To keep your education going, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. In our brand new spring issue, you can learn even more about summer camp criteria from Ryan, who contributed to that, to that issue, plus advice on addressing anxiety in children, preparing your teen for high school, and independence building strategies, and much more. Finally, the sponsor for today's webinar is Play Attention, Improve Executive Function and Self-Regulation. For more than 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed. Tufts University School of Medicine found play attention, significantly improved attention, executive function, academic performance, and behavioral control of students with ADHD. Your program will include a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Home and professional programs are available. You can call 828-676-2240 or click the link on your screen to schedule a free one-on-one -on -one consultation. You can visit playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without any further ado, thanks for your patience. I'm so pleased to welcome Ryan Wexelblatt. Ryan, thanks for joining us again and for leading this very timely discussion on making the best choices about summer camp. Thank you, Annie, and thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate it, and I want to welcome everybody who's uh, tuning in live today. I really appreciate you being here and your time and everyone who's going to be watching or listening on the replay or the podcast. So uh, I'm just going to uh, jump in. So here's what I hope you'll take away from today's presentation, uh, what to consider when selecting a camp, what questions to ask camp administrators to determine whether the camp can support your child, how much information to share about your child with the camp staff, and how to support the camp staff, common problems that I've seen occur at camp for kids with ADHD, and strategies to be proactive in addressing those issues, 
And I'm also going to provide you with a downloadable handout, uh, which is a letter you can fill in to share uh, with your child's camp to help them, you know, have a uh, better understanding of them. So uh, I do want to mention, I do have a general policy that I do not provide referrals of any kind. So I'm going to respectfully ask, uh, please do not contact me asking for a referral to a camp. Um, you are welcome to check out my YouTube channel, social media. Um, and I do love in, you know, interacting with folks on social media, but I don't provide referrals. And if you want to learn more about the work I do, please visit uh, the ADHD Dude YouTube channel, uh, my Attitude Magazine page called ADHD and Boys, or my website, ADHDDude.com. And I do want to mention everything in this presentation today is going to be applicable both to parents of boys and girls. Um, nothing in this uh, presentation is gender specific. So a little bit about me. I am a licensed uh, clinical social worker. I specialize solely in ADHD. Uh, my whole background has pretty much been with uh, ADHD and autism. Um, I started my career working in special ed schools for students with learning differences. Uh, the schools I worked at were primarily students with ADHD and autism. Um, I am the owner and the director of uh, Trip Camp, which is located in Margate, New Jersey and Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we're heading into our seventh summer in Margate and our first summer here in Tucson. And as I mentioned, I'm the creator of the uh, ADHD Dude YouTube channel and membership site. I'm a former school social worker and I uh, just finished out working at schools a few years ago, special ed schools. And I'm also father to a son with uh, ADHD and learning differences. So I always say I live and breathe this even when I don't feel like it. And I'm a lifelong camper. I started my uh, camp career at uh, age three. So. So here's the good news about camp. There are camps for families of all income levels. Most kids with ADHD do not need any type of specialized camp program, and they can be supported at local camps in their community. Camp can be a great confidence booster for kids with ADHD. It can help improve cognitive flexibility because being part of a group and having to work as part of a group and uh, teamwork and cooperation, all those things can be really helpful. It provides an opportunity to unplug from constant screen use, which is one of the you know, uh, greatest things about camp for me. And it can provide a social reset. And here's what I mean by a social reset. For kids with ADHD who struggle socially, you know, they tend to have a social history in school. When they go to camp where other kids don't really know them or don't go to school with them, it provides them an opportunity to kind of have a fresh start. So kids who, you know, maybe have been pigeonholed at, at their school, um, when they go to camp, this is an opportunity to, you know, develop new friendships and, and you know, kind of be almost say be somebody new. I mean, they're still themselves, but without that history there, they're, they're going in with a clean slate. And I find that's really helpful a lot of times for kids with ADHD. So a question I get regularly, um, both for schools and camps, is do I, does my child need a camp that markets itself to the ADHD community? So what we'll call special needs camps, um, they do have a higher staff to camper ratio. There are more adults present. They can certainly be better for campers who quickly become emotionally dysregulated. Uh, the staff will hopefully be more understanding and patient than maybe they would be at general camps. And some other things I do want to mention is that most of the special needs camps, they do need to take campers with a wide range of profiles um, due to the fact that they have higher tuition, particularly the overnight camps. Um, some campers I've found feel out of place amongst campers with more uh, significant support needs than they have. Uh, and, and the other thing to just keep in mind, and again, this is more for the overnight camps, um, that they can be much more emotionally taxing on the counselors. So there's, there's you know, several special needs overnight camps around the country. There's not a whole lot in terms of day camps or some smaller ones. Um, but, you know, when, when I'm talking about this, I just want everyone to understand, um, you know, the options are, are limited here in terms of camps that market themselves to, you know, the ADHD community or the uh, neurodiverse community, I should say. So here's some of my suggestions for day camps. So number one, I prefer to see kids stay at a day camp for an extended period of time as it provides consistency and it helps to build relationships. Now, I'm being a little hypocritical when I say this because my camp is a one-week camp, but for a lot of kids I found they just do better when they have that consistency week after week and it helps with forming relationships. So one-week camps are absolutely fine, um, but some kids just need that consistency. 
For kids who are prone to anxiety, I don't suggest one-week camps because for them, it can take much longer to feel comfortable and to establish those relationships. So really having that, um, that consistency of you know, several weeks um, is really what I find where they can be most successful. So these are questions I would ask if I were selecting a day camp for my child. So how many campers are in each bunk or age group and how many staff are with them consistently throughout the day? I would ask how structured is the camp day and how much unstructured free play time is there? The reason I ask that is because a lot of what I see uh, with kids with ADHD at camp is they tend to struggle during those unstructured times, particularly kids with more, you know, impulsive profile. I would ask how many uh, adults are present at the camp. What I can tell you is there tends to be a good amount of adults present at your average day camp. Um, at the bigger overnight camps, there tends to be a good amount of adults present. At some of the smaller camps, um, you know, the smaller overnight camps, there tends to be less adults uh, present. Um, and, you know, things like, you know, some scout camps or church camps, they tend to have less adults present as well. That is not necessarily a bad thing, I just want to clarify, but it's just a good thing, you know, to know. The other thing I like to ask is, do campers have swim lessons or do they swim every day? I find swimming to be tremendously helpful for kids with ADHD. And I also take swimming really seriously. And I want kids to, you know, learn how to swim um, if they're not strong swimmers, because swimming is a life skill, you know, and it's a, you know, it's a safety issue as well. So that's why I asked that. And the other thing I would ask is, what is the camp's electronics policy? I cannot emphasize this enough. And I will tell you for myself personally, if a camp told me that the campers are allowed to walk around with their phones during the day, I, I would say no thank you. Um, because that is not really camp then. That's you know keeping kids tethered to technology at all times. And when your face is staring down at a screen or you're on social media or games or whatever, you're not really having that interactive group experience, which is so important. And is and is really, you know, the essence of camp. Some more questions I would ask. Uh, what is the protocol if campers need a break? You know, is there a place they can go? Um, how does that work? So uh, the other question, what happens if a camper doesn't want to participate in activity? You know, I've seen at, uh, you know, some of the bigger day camps that for a lot of kids with ADHD, if they don't want to participate in activity, they're just kind of left alone and nobody bothers them. And, you know, I have a saying that for a lot of kids, particularly with more inattentive profile, um, when they're at camp, if they don't want to do something, they're, they're not that interested, they kind of walk around and collect sticks or, you know, maybe just have a talk with a buddy. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. But, you, you know, my feeling is you're not paying to have your child sit out of activities all day. And, you know, regardless, again, the, the experience of camp is learning how to be part of a group and work within a group. So there needs, for me, there needs to be some expectation, not only a positive encouragement of that kids participate, but just allowing them to sit out whenever they want is not okay. And unfortunately, that does happen at a lot of camps. They just kind of let the kids go and leave them alone because they're not making waves. Um, if your child takes medication during the day, I would ask uh, how medication's handled, obviously. Um, I would ask if there's somebody that kids can go to um, if they feel like they need help. So some camps have somebody like a guidance counselor, um, you know, in that type of role. Some have, you know, um, a person who's kind of in charge of that particular age group. They might call it a unit leader, something like that. And the other thing I would absolutely ask is if they can, the camp can tell you the profile of the kids that they've uh, found that have not been successful at camp. Because that will tell you a lot um, in terms of their ability of what they can handle. So that's a really important question to ask. Let's talk about why overnight camp can be life-changing for kids with ADHD. So it's an independent experience away from home that builds confidence, resilience, and a sense of accomplishment. It's an opportunity to learn how to live uh, with the same age peers. Uh, you're exposed to new activities and experiences that maybe, you know, activities you can't necessarily do at home. You learn from role models. So, you know, the, the older campers and the counselors. Again, it can provide a social reset for, you know, kids who might struggle socially at home. I've seen that be tremendously valued at overnight camp. And for most camps, the majority, it provides a screen detox, which can be really helpful for many kids with ADHD. Um, what parents often don't know about overnight camp. So in my experience, 
typically the earlier the kids start overnight camp, the easier it is to adjust the camp life. You know, a lot of times I find parents will think, oh, well, he's too young to go or she's too young to go. But really, it's, it's the younger kids who often have the easier adjustment and are actually less homesick. You know, the other thing is that kids are much more receptive to learning independent or life skills from camp counselors than they are from parents. You know, I can tell you a lot of kids will start doing things at, you know, camp that they haven't done at home, whether that's folding laundry, those kind of things. Um, so that's so overnight camp can be really valuable in that regard. And the other thing I want to mention is that homesickness is temporary and it typically occurs, you know, at down times and in the morning. And it's a process kids can learn to overcome, which absolutely builds pride and a sense of accomplishment. And again, what I tend to find is it's often older kids who experience more homesickness than younger kids. So some questions I would ask if I were selecting an overnight camp for my child. So I would refer you back to the questions uh, for the day camps as well. And these are some additions. So I would ask, does the camp schedule have a day during the week that is less structured? And how is this handled? You know, so I'll give you an example. When I was younger, I worked at an overnight camp um, where Saturdays, it was a Jewish camp. So um, Saturdays were, you know, the, uh, it was like the day of rest, Shabbat. So what would happen on Saturdays were the, you know, the kids can come and get breakfast on their own. And it was, they called it a lazy morning. So activities didn't start until, um, you know, about lunchtime, or it might've been right after lunch. Now that was okay for most kids, but some of the kids with ADHD at the camp struggled with that. And that's when, you know, I would find often a lot of the problems occurred on that lazy day in the morning. Most camps do have that, and whether it's because it's a day off for the, you know, for part of the staff, or it's just kind of a less structured day. So you really want to have clarity around that. Um, again, I would ask how many adults are, you know, in the camp, ad administrative staff. Um, how much downtime is there in the day, such as rest period, which typically occurs over lunch. Uh, I'm sorry, after lunch. Uh, shower time and free time before evening activity. And what is expected of campers during that time? Because again, at overnight camp, this is always when I see kids with ADHD struggle the most. It's during these downtimes, such as rest period, shower time, and the free time that's often before evening activities at overnight camps. So if we can get a sense of that and even have a discussion with the camp about how do you handle this and how do you handle kids who might struggle during that time? Um, the other thing I would mention as well with with both day and overnight camps is, you know, don't if if, you know, a lot of times parents will say to the camp, well, do you you know have kids who have ADHD? And the camp says, sure, we have kids with ADHD. And I'm not saying this with any kind of, you know, blame, but, you know, a lot of um, camp staff or administrators, they don't really know the difference between a more inattentive profile or more impulsive profile. So when they say, yes, we have a lot of kids with ADHD, it might be kids with a more um, in a ten of profile. Um, so that's why we really need to ask specific questions. Some more questions I would ask uh, in selecting an overnight camp. Um, again, what is your electronics policy? If uh, kids have phones, if they are allowed to have, you know, phones at some point, I'm again, I'm really not interested. Um, I just don't think that's that's it defeats the point of having a camp experience. You should ask about the communication with your child. What does that look like? Uh, most overnight camps require the kids to write home. Uh, most overnight camps, you know, allow at least one phone call during the session. Uh, what I will tell you is for a lot of the camps, they do not do phone calls during the first week, which I actually think is a good idea because as kids are getting adjusted, um, having a phone call from home during the first week can alleviate their anxiety and can exacerbate homesickness. So a lot, and that would really sabotage their ability to be successful. So a lot of camps do, uh, they don't start phone calls until after the first week. You also would want to know who will be your point person for communication during camp and how are medications handled. I will tell you, most overnight camps have uh, very efficient systems of handling medication. So what happens is you would get medication uh, prepackaged. They work with companies who prepackage the meds, send them directly to camp, um, and it makes it very convenient for parents and it makes things, you know, uh, very orderly for the camp to be able to dispense meds. So let's talk about camp staff for a little bit. So day camp staff are often teenagers, usually, you know, high school kids, uh, you know, 11th, 12th grade, um, or young adults, and they typically have one orientation day, maybe two orientation days. 
Overnight camp staff are typically 18 um, to their mid 20s with up to a week of orientation. And, you know, kids love being with the camp counselors. That is one of the most important parts of, of camp for kids. Kids do not want a middle-aged parent as their camp counselor. And you're not going to find a camp that is comprised of staff who are, you know, all teachers. Um, most teachers do not want to work in the summer. And again, you know, kids want to be playing and doing things. Um, you know, so that's why having, you know, younger staff of this age, why it's really critical to the camp experience. You know, I can tell you, I've regularly had people reach out to me, whether they were therapists and, and say, oh, you know, can I work at your camp? And, and I explained to them, I said, you know, we're not doing therapy here. This is not, you know, kind of sitting around and talking. We're doing activities. Um, and if they are on board with that, I, I would say, okay. But most of them have this different image because when they hear ADHD, they think we're going to be sitting around talking about ADHD all day, which is definitely not the case. So the other thing I want to mention is that, you know, besides counselors being one of the most essential parts of the camp experience, is that we have to keep in mind they are young adults working for very meager pay, particularly at overnight camp, and long hours, and their brains are not fully uh, developed yet. So they deserve a lot of grace and understanding. Um, many camps, I can tell you, and I've been hearing this more over the past few years, um, they're struggling with this generation of staff. Um, not all, you know, but but some due to their lack of resiliency and problem solving skills. So some of the things I'm hearing are, you know, staff asking for mental health days off or things like that, that, you know, 10 years ago, we weren't really hearing about. So I don't want that to be a deterrent for anyone. But I think we do need to acknowledge that obviously we know this generation um, is more fragile than any generation before them. So that's just something to, you know, to understand um, because sometimes, you know, at, at camp, sometimes the counselors get frustrated um, or sometimes they're emotional about things. And, you know, that's just part of this. I mean, they're not, you know, adults who have been doing this for years and years. So in terms of helping to set your child up for success, I cannot emphasize enough that transparency is the key to setting your child up for success. Do not withhold information about your child. If you do, then the camp lacks context for understanding your child. You know, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of, you know, a child with ADHD going to camp and the parents withhold that from the camp because they're worried that the camp won't accept their child. And then obviously, the, you know, the camp administrators, they, you know, they have experience with kids. They realize that something is up and they don't like, you know, parents withholding information from them. But more importantly, it's doing a disservice to the child. So you want to be upfront with the camp from the beginning. If the camp tells you that their camp is not where your child could be most successful, respect their honesty. They are not setting your child up for a potential failure. You know, when I have to tell a parent that I don't think we can support your child here and I, you know, refer them to a camp that I think would have a higher level of support, most of the time they're appreciative and sometimes, you know, they get angry. And what I really want to say to them is I'm saving you money and I'm saving your child from, you know, experiencing failure because I don't want to put any family in that situation. So please respect them if, if they say, we don't think that we can handle this. The other thing to keep in mind is camp is not school. They don't need to follow 504 plans. They don't need to follow IEPs. So if you have some idea that you're going to go in and say, oh, here's my child's school accommodations. No, it's, it's not happening. Okay. And so just keep that in mind. Uh, but what would be really helpful in terms of sharing information is you can use the letter that you're going to see towards this end, the end of this presentation um, that I really encapsulated why I thought was some of the most important information that you can share with the camp to help your child have a successful experience. So some questions to ask to gauge the camp's understanding of ADHD. Uh, I would ask, how do you find campers with an inattentive profile do at camp? How about campers with a hyper imp impulsive profile? And what you're looking for there is to see, can they discern the difference? Um, and what has their experience been of that? Um, again, are there opportunities for campers to take a break if necessary? And how would that work? You know, I've heard some, I've heard of uh, some overnight camps that are really trying to be more inclusive now and will actually have kind of a sensory break room that campers can go to during the day, which is great. I would ask, you know, how uh, have you had any challenges with challenges with kids with ADHD that you were that were more than you could handle at camp? Because, again, you want to be able to gauge what is their threshold for what they feel that they can handle and not handle. 
And, and, you know, again, I can't emphasize enough, what's your policy about campers not wanting to participate in activity and how is that handled? I can't tell you how many kids I have seen over the years who, you know, barely participate in anything at camp and they're not unhappy. They just, you know, do what they want to do. Um, but that, you know, that causes distance between them and the other kids in their age group um, because they're not fully being part of the group there. You know, and I'm not saying, you know, kids have to like every activity at camp. That's OK if they don't. But what we don't want is them kind of dictating what they're doing and not doing. So here are some common problems um, I've seen kids with ADHD experience at camp. So as I mentioned, uh, being allowed to sit out of activities as much as they want. Uh, lack of opportunities to decompress or take space. Um, sometimes kids will have a distorted perception of peer conflicts. So for kids with ADHD who struggle socially, they tend to have difficulty with perspective taking. So understanding others' thoughts and understanding how they're coming across to others. Perspective taking is really the foundational, what I call social executive function skill. So kids with ADHD have perspective taking skills. They just are often lagging behind and not used consistently. So what I often see happen both at school and camp is there might be a child with ADHD who can be provocative of their peers, whether that's for attention seeking or whatever it might be. And then, or they're, you know, being inflexible and, you know, saying we're playing this way or they yell at other kids. And then when other kids respond negatively to them, they don't necessarily understand why. And in some cases they say they're being bullied. When in reality, they're not being bullied, it's that their behavior elicited a negative response from their peers. So we, in those situations, you know, we have to ask for clarification from the adults there because we want to have a full picture. And if the issue is that the child is struggling with perspective taking, we have to help them kind of understand the sequence of events as to why their words or behaviors elicited a negative response from their peers. Uh, I've seen, you know, kids definitely not drink enough water at camp and get headaches because when you are on stimulants, stimulants can be dehydrating. Um, and if you're not drinking enough water, you're going to get a headache, sometimes get sick. So um, that's another thing we want to, you know, make sure and, and ask, you know, how are they ensuring that kids are drinking enough water during the day? Um, the unstructured time, as I mentioned, particularly at overnight camps with kids getting into trouble. The other thing I want to mention is I do not want to see kids with a one-on-one -on -one, with a you know one-on-one -on -one at camp or you know an, an aid. And let me explain why. When a lot of camps will will do this, they will say, "Well, we can take your child, but they have to have you know an, an aid with them." And sometimes the camp will supply that aid, and sometimes they will make the parents pay for it. But I think that is socially stigmatizing for kids. And I think, you know, it also is not helpful if we're trying to help kids learn self-regulation and we're trying to help them, you know, develop problem-solving skills. You know, having, you know, an adult or a young adult with you constantly all day saying, do this, don't do this, that's not helpful to that process. I'm okay with a, you know, with a aid being there for, you know, several kids, but I don't ever want to see kids having a one-on-one -on -one aid at camp. The other thing, and I cannot emphasize this enough, Camp is not the time for a medication vacation. You know, I will hear, um, you know, prescribing physicians sometimes tell parents, okay, well, you know, they're, they're not in school, so, you know, you can take a break from meds for the summer. Not a good idea. Camp has many demands just like school does. They might not be academic demands, but they're still demands in terms of, you know, sustaining attention and self-regulation. So I've, I can't tell you how many times I've seen kids not have a successful camp experience simply because they took a med vacation. The other thing I, you know, I want to mention as well is, and this is a little off topic, but uh, Dr. Joseph Biederman, who just passed away recently, um, he's one of the four, he was one of the foremost researchers in uh, ADHD. At the medical ADHD conference um, two years ago, you know, one of the things he said was, we need to stop using ADHD medications as their Tylenol or academic, you know, performance enhancing drugs. Meaning if kids are on meds, they should be on them consistently. Um, and I think, you know, camp is a perfect example as to why. So some things about setting your child up for success. So you want to speak about your confidence and their ability to be successful. So when we talk about camp, you know, say, I know you're going to do really well there. You know, we're, we're showing them that we are confident in their ability, okay, even if they don't feel confident, because we want to let them see that we are confident in them. Because if you're showing your anxiety or you're worried about if they're going to be successful and that gets conveyed to them, well, that could be setting them up for failure. 
I definitely suggest, you know, touring the camp if possible and going to an open house. Most day camps and overnight camps actually do offer open houses. So definitely, you know, take that to your advantage if they do. Um, the other thing I would say, do not make medication adjustments right before camp starts or during camp. That's another reason I've seen ca uh, kids struggle is because a med change was made right before camp started, um, and they might have not had a great reaction to this um, change. So we don't want to make any med changes right before camp starts or during camp. The other thing, do not say things like, you know, if you don't like it, you don't have to go. That is setting kids up for failure. Because when you say things like, you know, you don't have to go, what you're telling them is if you are temporarily uncomfortable, then I'm going to rescue you from your temporary discomfort. When you rescue kids from temporary discomfort, they don't have an opportunity to learn about their abilities. They don't have the opportunity to learn that discomfort is temporary and they can learn to overcome it because all feelings are temporary. And for, for kids going to overnight camp, we don't want to say things to them like, you know, I'm going to miss you so much. Because what that can do is it can cause them to feel guilty for being away or cause them to feel they are responsible for your feelings. I've seen a lot of kids really struggle at camp when that happens. So what happens if your child says that they don't want to go to camp? Well, a lot of kids with ADHD will say no to anything new or unfamiliar. And if you accommodate that and just let them avoid any new experiences, because again, they don't want to, you know, have to persevere through that temporary discomfort of being in a new social situation. They never learn that they can get through that. And they never develop the sense of accomplishment that comes from realizing I was able to go into a new situation and be successful. Um, some kids, you know, have diff some kids with ADHD have difficulty with what's called episodic memory which is the emotions we have associated with past experiences. You know, for reasons we don't really know, um, I find for a lot of kids with ADHD, they don't remember necessarily positive or um, positive, you know, um, I'm sorry, experiences that have a positive emotion attached to them. They tend to remember experiences that have strong negative emotions attached to them. So a lot of times, you know, what I've heard is, you know, parents will tell me, you know, oh, you know, she did great at camp. She was really successful. But then when I asked her in January, if she wanted to go back, she said, no, it was boring. Well, it's not that actually the child thought it was boring. It's that she's not recalling how she felt when she was at the camp because the time horizon, you know, or her ability to recall those emotions from that far back, you know, are compromised. So she's not remembering that she had a good time and she was successful. So please keep that in mind. You know, again, a lot of kids with ADHD have a fear of stepping out of their comfort zone. That does not mean that it's healthy to keep them within their comfort zone. Okay. Um, and the other thing I will tell you, I have a saying, I say, flexibility is cultivated, inflexibility is accommodated. So if, you know, for kids who say, well, I don't like anything except video games. If we accommodate their inflexibility and say, okay, well, you don't have to have any new experiences, that doesn't help them cultivate flexibility that accommodates their inflexibility. And when inflexibility is accommodated, it does cause it to get worse over time. I see a lot of families of kids with ADHD where sometimes kids are viewed as the partner that, you know, the parent's partner in parenting. Um, parents allow, you know, the kids to, um, you know, chime in on their parenting decisions. So what I always teach is your child is not your partner in parenting. You do not need them to approve of your parenting decisions because they do not have the emotional maturity or foresight to know what is best for them and make adult decisions. So please do not allow your child to make adult decisions. That is your job as a parent. If your child is resistant to new experiences like camp, sometimes you're going to have to step into your parental authority and say, this is what's happening and not get pulled into what I call the argument vortex with them. Okay? Please keep in mind that kids are not fragile. Kids are anti-fragile. And kids need to have repeated experiences of, you know, being in new social situations with their peers. They need to have repeated experiences of, you know, having conflicts with peers to develop these independent problem solving skills and flexibility and resiliency and confidence. Without those experiences, kids are not going to develop that confidence and resiliency and that, you know, ability to solve problems independently. And please know you will not cause trauma by requiring them to participate in healthy social experiences like camp. You know, I find right now the word trauma is being thrown around a lot. 
And really what, you know, uh, what, what I'm finding is that um, temporary discomfort is sometimes being labeled as trauma. But we need to keep in mind the bigger picture here again, that kids are not fragile. Kids are anti-fragile. I do need to mention how I have seen parents sabotage their child's camp experience. So one is trying to micromanage or helicopter their child's, you know, experience at camp. Um, I have seen camps say to parents, you know what, your child's fine here, but, you know, you're, you know, you're requiring too much of our time and we're, we're going to need to part ways. Um, and that is really unfortunate, particularly if a child's being successful, that a camp is saying, you know, we're, we're not doing this because a parent is trying to micromanage their child's experience so much. And, you know, with good intentions, sometimes I, you know, hear about parents who are doing what's called fishing for the negatives. So instead of saying, you know, well, what was fun at camp today or what activities did you do? You know, they'll say things like, was anybody mean to you today? You know, what bad, you know, what bad things, you know, did you not like doing at camp? When you fish for the negatives, a lot of times kids will learn that, oh, when I speak negatively about things, that's a way to get my parents undivided attention but it also shows their concern for me. So I'm going to speak negatively about experiences for that reason. So we want to, you know, frame questions in the positive always, both with camp and school. And we don't want to be fishing for the negatives because that can just bring that on. These are specific to overnight camp of how I've seen parents sabotage their child's camp experience. So demanding to speak with their child on the phone. Um, often, you know, when that happens, it's the camp is done with then um, the, the child goes home because, you know, the 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 child hears the parents anxiety or the parents emotional neediness in their voice um, and they start feeling guilty that they're away and then they wind up going home um, off, you know, and I will tell you, I did this myself as a camper. Um, often when at overnight camp, kids will write negative letters home. And when parents are emotionally reactive to that, you know, that can also sabotage their experience. I can tell you, I used to write negative letters home every year at the beginning of overnight camp. Why? Because I was uncomfortable or because, you know, I was inconvenienced because I didn't have TV, you know, and my parents never responded to them. I even threatened one year. I said, if you don't pick me up, I am going to take the camp golf cart and drive home. Home was four and a half hours <laughs> away, by the way. So needless to say, that did not happen. But I always got through it and I always got over it. Another reason, uh, unintentionally causing the child to feel responsible for their feelings. So saying things like, I miss you so much, or I can't wait until you're home. We don't want kids to feel guilty for having an independent experience away from home. And we never want kids to feel responsible for their parents' feelings, okay? And the other part is not allowing them to get through temporary homesickness. I can tell you in all my years you know, at, at overnight camp, I can probably count on one hand the number of kids who were not able to make it because of homesickness. And I will tell you in all those cases, the reason that they were not able to was because there was something significant going on in the family, such as they might, I've seen, you know, kids who they unfortunately lost a parent before camp started and it just wasn't the right uh, time for them to be away. Um, and those cases are rare. Most kids and almost all cases can get through that initial homesickness. And again, that is really a confidence booster and gives you a sense of pride when you realize I overcame something difficult. Sometimes things do not work out as we had hoped at camp. I can tell you that happened with my son one year. So if that does happen, you know, you explain to your child that not every camp works for every kid and you will try again next summer, either at that camp or a different one, you know, depending on how things worked out and how you feel about it. And, you know, if you if you do have concerns going into this about your child's ability to be successful at camp, I do suggest having a backup plan for the summer. You know, recently I spoke with a family and they were planning on sending their child to, uh, you know, an overnight camp that I know, just a general overnight camp. Um, and I know it well because my friends went there and worked there. And I said to this family, you know, given this child's profile, I said, I, my concern is he's not going to be successful there. And my concern is that you may be setting him up for failure of having to come home. So, you know, nothing against the camp, but I just, that is not what I would suggest for him because we, we don't want to set him up for potential failure if we can avoid that. So keep that in mind. 
So uh, before some questions, I do have a YouTube channel that has uh, hours of free content organized into playlists. There's an executive function playlist, social skills, uh, behavior. And uh, if you just go to, uh, yeah, type in uh, the, the uh, ampersand or at symbol uh, ADHD dude on YouTube, you'll find that. Okay. And this is the letter that I created uh, that you can share with your child's camp. I know it's a little hard to see here for those of you who are watching this. But again, it's the information that I felt was most important for parents to share with their child's camp. OK, so you can fill this out as it is. I designed it so you can fill it out. Or if you just want to use this as a template and, you know, write your own letter, that's totally fine as well. You can do that. So if you would like to download the letter, uh, you can scan this QR code here. Uh, for those who are listening um, on the uh, podcast, um, I will uh, put a link to this in my uh, social media. So on my um, Instagram page, I'll put a link to this as well as a Facebook page if you'd like to be able to download this. OK. And before we finish up, I just want to mention that, you know, some of the best things about camp and number one, camp is one of the most powerful builders of self-confidence that I have found. And I hope I've emphasized that enough during this presentation. You know, camp is a microcosm of the world and one that provides a tremendous learning opportunity for kids. And here's the most important one I have found for years and years for many kids with ADHD, camp is really where they shine. And for many, it's where they feel most at home and where they feel that they can be themselves. And I cannot emphasize that enough that for so many kids with ADHD, this has such a profound positive impact on them. So thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time. Uh, again, you can uh, follow ADHD Dude on your preferred social media. I'm on all of them. Main content is on my YouTube channel. And thank you. Yeah, and I will be happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ryan, that you gave us so many good pointers, questions, tips, and considerations. So we appreciate that. We do have some great questions. Before I start on that, I will quickly thank our sponsor, Play Attention, once more for making today's webinar possible. And um, the poll results I found really interesting because they dovetailed so nicely with with your presentation, the number one priority for parents here today when thinking about their kids' summer was building self-esteem, hmm. which is great to hear. Um, and, you know, on that, um, it, we had a couple of questions from folks who um, had cited past um, challenges with mm -hmm. camp and, and the self-esteem hits that are associated with that. Yeah. So, Someone wrote in and said that her son was asked to leave three different day camps last summer and yeah. that they are both feeling a sense of dread um, about the it, this summer and the planning that goes with that. Um, can you offer any advice for that parent um, of how to set up their child for success this summer in both communicating with their child and with the um, potential camps? Yeah, so it's a little hard for me to answer this without having more context for kind of understanding what, what happened and kind of the size of the camps and those things. But I think the one thing I would ask this parent is, was the camp too big for their child? You know, I um, when I was in college, I worked at a you know huge day camp in the Philadelphia area. Um, and when I think about it now, that camp would probably be so overstimulating. It's a wonderful camp, but it would be so overstimulating to kids who have sensory issues um, or kids who are maybe prone to anxiety. So that's the first thing I would ask is, was the camp too big for him? Um, would it be easier for him to navigate a much smaller program, um, you know, instead? That would be the first thing. The next thing I would say is I would be transparent with, you know, a potential camp you're looking at and and say to them, you know, here's what happened. And I just wanted to see if you feel that, you know, you could support my son. And I will tell you, you know, they might not say this to you, but a lot of the camps know which camps have greater tolerance and ability to provide for, you know, kids with ADHD or kids with, you know, neurodevelopmental differences than other camps. So I think that's the key is just being transparent and I think, you know, going with a smaller camp, whatever that may look like, may be what is necessary to help set him up for success. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, the, the next most important priority for parents was to have their children being active outdoors. And you hmm. spoke about the importance of a no technology 
policy. So <laughs> you were very clear about that. And um, we did have one parent wrote in to say, what's your opinion of camps like robotics camps or camps that are kind of built around technology? If that's your child's passion, mm -hmm. um, could there be you know, room for technology in that scenario? Yeah. So let me clarify. I think, you know, like robotics camps are great because they involve a lot of group work. Um, so I'm, I'm all for that. What I'm specifically talking about is camps where kids are in front of screens most of the day. That's what I don't want to see, because when you're constantly in front of a screen on your own, you're not interacting with your peers. Okay? That's number one. The other thing I will say, too, is I'm not a fan of virtual camps where kids are sitting at home on a computer you know, doing activities. Um, you know, I think sometimes, you know, we people think that, you know, well, uh, you know, our kids, when they're older, they're just going to live in virtual reality. And the truth is that's that's not going to happen. OK, kids still need to have real life interactions in person with other kids. So something like robotics is a great way to be able to do that. OK, excellent. Now, the third priority, um, unsurprisingly, was um, making and spending time with friends was a was a priority. A lot of questions here about um, social skills, and I know that that is an area of expertise for you. Um, and we got a question from um, someone at an overnight camp who was asking for advice on how can counselors help kids who are struggling with social skills to help them, you know, develop these relationships without being, you know, too much in the mix. Yeah. So two things I want to mention about this first, you know, we know that kids with ADHD learn best in the moment. And that is something that is, you know, where camp can be so helpful because camp is in the moment teaching. So let's keep that in mind first. OK. And for kids who struggle socially, I just want to be really clear with everyone that kids are not going to improve socially by sitting in a therapy office. OK. Or. Um, you know, you role playing scenarios at home because all social interactions are context dependent. But what is going to be helpful is when people can help address these things in the moment, such as at camp or at school. So what can counselors do to help? Well, I think given that, you know, most people don't have training in this, I would say, you know, to to help the counselors by just having some background. So I'll just use myself, for example, in my membership site, I have a webinar series called Socially Smarter. And the first three sections of Socially Smarter are about how to help kids improve their perspective taking skills. So if the administrative staff can sh share some specific strategies with the counselors, I think that would be most helpful in order to do that. Um, and I will tell you, you know, for this webinar series, I do have school counselors using it. So I don't see any reason why, you know, camp staff can't use it as well um, just to you know, help provide some actionable strategies that they can teach to the staff to help, you know, with, with kids socially in the moment. Okay. Um, and we did get a question from uh, an attendee here today who said that um, their child actually loves going to sleepaway camp, but she tends to gravitate toward younger campers or the staff, um, yeah. which I think is, is common. Um, and the mom is wondering, should she be concerned? Is this something that she should try to address to um, encourage her child to um, engage more with campers of her own age? Yeah, so let me provide some context for everyone first why this happens. A lot of kids with ADHD gravitate towards younger kids because younger kids have lower social expectations than their same age peers. They can also be a role model and that makes them feel good. Um, and the other reason is because sometimes they can control situations, you know, with with younger kids. Um, so if they have a propensity to be inflexible, younger kids are more likely to go along with them saying, telling them what to do. So those are the reasons they gravitate towards younger kids. The reason they tend to gravitate towards adults is that adults are going to be patient and understanding with them. So, for instance, if, you know, your child is having kind of a one sided conversation where they're talking at a peer about something and just kind of rambling off facts. Well, your peer is probably going to get bored at some point because they're not showing interest in them and they're probably going to tune out or walk away. Whereas if a child you know, has a one sided conversation with an adult and they're talking at them, the adult is going to be polite and listen to them and they're not going to say, you know, you're boring me right now or they're not going to necessarily walk away. So that's why kids with ADHD tend to gravitate towards younger kids or towards adults. To answer this parent's question, I would very much emphasize to the camp that you want 
you would like them to help her interact with her similar age peers. And if they see her gravitating towards the staff, you want the staff to direct her towards the other kids and help her enter into, you know, a conversation or enter into a play situation with the, you know, similar age peers. Um, and same thing with younger kids. If they see her gravitating towards younger kids, you want the staff's help to help her gravitate more towards, you know, the similar age peers in her age group. Um, so camp can be tremendously helpful, you know, for that, but we have to be really clear and ask the counselors to help with that. Otherwise they are going to spend all their time pretty much with, you know, younger kids or talking to the staff. Okay. And um, similarly, another parent asked um, if you have advice that they have a, a child who is more on the inattentive side and quiet and could easily fade into the background at a camp. They want to ask some pointed questions about what the camp will do to make sure that their child is engaging. Yeah. So first thing I would say is you want to give a really clear picture of how you think your child will, will present at camp. If you think that they're going to be one of those kids who is walking around collecting sticks, you know, during kickball or something, you want to be really specific in that. And then you want to give them really specific suggestions for things to do to help reel them in. But you also want to tell them that your expectations. So, for instance, you know, I don't want him or her sitting out of every activity that she might not find that interesting. And I would like you to help, you know, encourage her to participate. Um, if you see her, you know, wandering around, you know, again, please reel her in. So, you know, explain to them first what your child will look like, you know, based on, on your experience and then what you are asking of them and just be really specific about it. And I find that, again, I find camps are appreciative of that um, because you are being, you know, transparent. And when you approach this in a way proactively, um, I find, yeah, they, the camp staff are really appreciative when parents do that. Okay. And if the camp does contact you as a parent to say that, to report that your child um, isn't participating, doing bunk chores, that sort of thing, and they're, they need um, tips from you to fix this, um, what, <laughs> what's the best response from the parent, assuming that they did, as you said, give some context before the child went to camp? Yeah. So I just want to clarify, there's a difference between not participating in an activity. You know, I'm going to use myself, for example, when I was younger, I, I, I was never into sports, so I would try to sit out of sports as much as possible at camp. But when we're talking about, you know, a bunk activity, or I'm sorry, when we're talking about like, you know, bunk chores, um, the first question I would ask the parent is, did you teach them these things beforehand? And you, if you're not sure what is going to be part of that, I would reach out to the camp and say, you know, what happens every day during bunk cleanup and what skills can I work on with my child before they come to camp so they can participate in, you know, the daily cleanup time, which, you know, all overnight camps have. Um, if they have difficulty with something like folding clothes, well, are they having difficulty because they were never taught that at home or because maybe they resort to learned helplessness at home and so the parent picks up and starts doing it for them? Um, or are they just kind of, you know, struggling with the sequence of it? So I can tell you in all my years, I have, I've always had to help kids with at, at overnight camp with, you know, those common things like, you know, packing to go home or folding clothes, those kind of things. And, and it's okay if some kids need more support than others. Again, I think the more transparent you can be, the better. But also for going to overnight camp, you do want to find out what, in what independent skills are going to be expected of them so you can work on them before camp starts. Okay, that's uh, great advice and dovetails with another question, which was, um, are there any other things that you would recommend in sort of preparing your child um, maybe more emotionally and psychologically for like their first uh, sleepaway camp experience? Yes. So one of the things that can be really helpful is, you know, a lot of kids with ADHD learn visually, um, and this generation tends to be visual learners. So um, all camps, pretty much, if you're going there, will give you access to their photo site so you can see photos and videos. So just seeing the physical space there and seeing the kids can really be helpful with that. And it also helps them kind of get to know, you know, some of the staff who will be there as well, get to know them in the sense that they're familiar to them. Um, that's the first thing. I think the next thing is that, you know, to acknowledge that sometimes, you know, problems occur at camp. Not everybody gets along all the time, particularly when you're living with eight other kids your age or 10 other kids, whatever it is. So 
know that problems are going to arise and sometimes people's feelings are going to be hurt and sometimes somebody's going to be mad at somebody but this is all part of the learning experience and again you know we can talk about this as you know camp is kind of this microcosm of the world so what matters is you know do we ask for help when we need help and who do we go to when we feel like we need help the counselors or you know whomever so just knowing that there are people there to help them and support them and they understand specifically you know who those those people are i think Okay, great. And um, understandably, a lot of kids feel you know anxious about going to a camp where they don't know anyone. What is your thought on coordinating for your child to attend camp with a friend? And also, um, is it a good idea to split up siblings so that they're not at the same camp at the same time? Um, do you have thoughts on, on those? Yeah, I'm sorry. Just repeat the first part of the question. Oh, um, is it reasonable to coordinate for your child to attend oh. camp with a friend who who they knew or know outside of yeah. previous camp experiences? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say some kids that there's a comfort level with with that. Um, and that's fine. The issue I can tell you I've seen sometimes is, for instance, you know, let's say that, you know, your child goes to camp with the friend. And the friend wants to branch out a little bit and spend time with other kids. Well, a lot of times I've seen, you know, the child with ADHD become a little possessive or become jealous because their friend who they came with, you know, is branching out a little bit and they are still latching on to them. So I've seen that, you know, create some peer conflict sometimes at camp. Um, that's the first thing with that. But but it's really up to you and what you think would be most helpful for your child. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for that. In terms of siblings, I mean, I can tell you, a, you know, most camps I've ever worked at, um, you know, there's always been siblings there. So I don't ever see that being an issue. Um, at overnight camp, I'm thinking about, you know, over the years, the, you know, twins that, uh, that I've had. Um, and that's really been fine as well. You know, what's interesting, I found when twins are together at overnight camp, they often tend to not pay that much attention to each other. Um, <laughs> ironically, the biggest issue I've ever had with uh, siblings at camp was uh, I had identical twin counselors, not even in the same bunk, but in the same age group. And, and their, their fighting with each other was a much bigger issue than any of this, the kids' siblings, the camper siblings. So, yeah, so I think it's fine. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, now, as much as I did appreciate your story about trying to or threatening to hijack the golf cart and leave camp, <laughs> um, we did get a number of questions from parents who are legitimately concerned um, about their kids' negative reactions to camp. And one who said that their child has threatened self-harm. Now, mm -hmm. what is the line when you really do ratchet up the concern and, and take a step that um, it's time to either end camp or for you to intervene more seriously. Yeah. So I think the first thing is, you know, and one of the things is that in my experience of doing this for two decades now, kids with ADHD become highly skilled at an emotional manipulation of their parents. And if anybody's listening to this and say, kids can't manipulate, I'm respectfully saying to you, please go read a child development book. Yes, they can. And kids with ADHD are particularly skilled at doing this with their parents. Um, number one, if your child says that, I would, you know, bring that up to the camp staff and, and have them ask, you know, when I've seen this happen, I think I've only dealt with this once, you know, the child said, no, I was just angry, you know, at, at my parents because, you know, they, I felt like they weren't listening to me. So the other thing is, you know, you have to keep in mind as well is that when we rescue kids from positive experiences like camp, then we're, what we teach them is whenever you're uncomfortable, I will rescue you, okay? And again, that doesn't help kids learn how to persevere through temporary discomfort. All feelings are temporary. Anxiety is temporary, okay? Dis, you know, being uncomfortable in new social situations is temporary. So I would say, you know, you want to be supportive. You want to ask for the staff support. You want to tell the staff what the child said so they can speak with them. Okay, and, and go from there with that, you know, and most importantly, do not react to this and say, okay, I'll come get you now that you've threatened to hurt yourself, okay, because that's doing your child a disservice. You know, I hear almost on a weekly basis of kids with ADHD who do things at home, like, you know, take knives out and point knives at themselves and when they, you know, don't get enough video game time or they're not getting what they want. So just keep in mind that when kids are feeling anxious or uncomfortable, 
okay, that often produces a response that is not really who they are. It's a response based on how they're feeling at that moment. Okay. And um, I'll squeeze in one quick last question because I, I think you may have mentioned it during the presentation, but we got a few questions asking, is there an ideal age for starting overnight camp specifically for kids um, who are neurodivergent? That's an excellent question. Um, if you ask 10 different, 10 different people, as you would probably get 10 different answers. I think number one is dependent on the child's self-regulation skills. But as a general rule, I can tell you I've seen many, many kids with you know ADHD or even kids with autism at overnight camp at eight or nine, and they did beautifully. So I, I tend to say you know somewhere between eight and 10, I think is ideal. Um, when they get to 11, that's when they, they, the homesickness is a little more significant, and then it just kind of goes up from there. You know, and part of the reason for that is as, you know, kids get older, if they haven't had independent experiences, sometimes they become more over-dependent on their parents. So if they are, you know, eased into having this independent experience at a younger age, it's just often, you know, a lot easier for them. But again, that completely depends on the child. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. Wonderful. Well, sadly, we have run out of time, but um, Ryan, thank you so much for leading another really helpful webinar for Attitude. We appreciate your contributions um, to this well, community. Um, thank you so much for having me. Of course, always. Um, and for those of you listening, thank you so much for joining us. We do have free weekly webinars here at Attitude, and next week is on a very different topic, and that is invisible, quote unquote, disabilities at work. Um, and that's with Dr. Jessica Hickstead. We hope you will join us for that. Of course, if you sign up for our newsletters, attitudemag.com slash newsletters, you can make sure that you never miss uh, an alert about an article, research update, or a webinar coming up. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great day.